can hear me. We, we can't hear you. Um, you appear to be on mute. Well, I, I didn't think I was on mute. Am I on mute now? No, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Fine. Um, our next witness is Mr Copping. Yeah. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but, and the, nothing truth. but the truth. Thank you very much. Take a seat. Please give your full name. Peter James Copping. Um, you should have in front of you um, a witness statement dated the 2nd of September of this year. Yes. Um, could I ask you please to turn to page 18 of your statement? Do you okay. see your signature there at the end of the statement? Yes. Um, is the content of the statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Mr Cobbin, your, your statement and its exhibits uh, are now in evidence before the inquiry. I'd like to begin by asking you a few questions about your professional background. Um, you qualified as a chartered engineer and are a fellow of the Institute of Engineering and Technology, is that correct? That's correct. Um, what competencies were you required to demonstrate to qualify as a chartered engineer? Um, it's a long process, but in essence you have to display technical competences, managerial competences um, in quite a wide range of topics. You've explained that you worked in the electronics and telecommunications industry for approximately 10 years before joining PA Consulting, is that That's right? correct. Uh, PA Consulting being a management information and technology consultancy. That's correct. Um, and you joined that organization in 1976? Yes. Before being appointed a director of PA Consulting in 1990, um, you worked on a variety of uh, telecommunications and information technology projects, is yes. that right? Um, did these re projects require you at any stage to undertake um, software design and development? Uh, personally, no, but I did lead teams that were doing that. How would you characterise your ex area of expertise uh, in engineering? Uh, broadly speaking, uh, I would characterise it as in, in the telecommunications area, networking and IT. You first became involved in Horizon when you were commissioned in the summer of 1997 to lead a review by PA Consulting of what was known at the time as the Benefits Agency and Post Office Counters uh, program, is that correct? That's correct. Um, had you ever previously worked on a project um, of the scale and complexity of Horizon? Uh, not quite the same. I've certainly worked on large projects of uh, similar scale in uh, the mobile telecommunications area in particular. Did you have any prior experience of working on an IT system developed by ICL? No. Um, I'd like to, if I can, briefly explore uh, what you understood at the time about the broader context um, of uh, the review that you were asked to undertake. Why had that review been commissioned? Sorry, could you repeat that? Why had your review in the summer of 97, to your understanding, been commissioned? Uh, primarily because of delays to the project. Um, and what, what, had, uh, what had arisen as a result of those delays? Um, there were concerns um, about the possibility of future delays. There were concerns about uh, Pathways' ability to deliver, and uh, there were concerns about uh, Post Office readiness to accept Horizon. In your statement, you describe the purpose of the review um, as being to identify the reasons for the delay to the project and to recommend actions to de-risk the project to bring it back on track. Is that correct? That's correct. You were also required, were you not, to make an assessment of the programme's future delivery capability? That's correct. That assessment involved examining not only management and resourcing issues, but also the technical aspects of the project, 
which had a bearing on the program's ability to deliver its end-to-end -end delivery That's obligations. Correct. You've explained in your statement your review uh, focused on four principal areas. Um, these were the business objectives of each stakeholder, the contractual arrangements between the parties, thirdly, the program management processes, and finally, the technical infrastructure proposed for Horizon by ICL Pathway. Is that right? Yes. You use the term um, technical infrastructure in your statement. Can you explain what you mean by that? Uh, essentially, that is the hardware platform on which the software services reside um, at, uh, from the counter back into various back-end systems. Are you suggesting, therefore, that you were, only, it, you were only asked to consider the hardware as opposed to the software no, no. system? Um, elsewhere in the documents, we see the, we see the term technical architecture used. So far as you're concerned, um, are they one and the same, architecture and infrastructure? Uh, the architecture defines the various layers in the system that uh, work together to make up the infrastructure. So slightly different nuances then? Y yes. Uh, do you recall how far the project had progressed at the point at which you undertook your review in the summer of 1997? When we started work, um, there was a. We, I think we were presented with a, a program rework which was titled Version 3. Um, and I think all of our work was based on that particular document. It, it might assist you if we bring that up. Um, that's POL. 00028186, please. Um, is this the document to which you were yes. referring? The, the Programme Delivery Authority Master Plan, yes. version 3, dated 8th, 8th of April 1997. Um, could we turn to page 8, please? Um, we see there a, a number of strategic milestones in the project. Can you, can you see that in front of you? Yep. Um, the first of which was the initial go-live implemented uh, in one post office on the 23rd of September 96 uh, and then rolled out to 10 post offices on the 21st of October 96. Yes. Um, that was followed by uh, the rollout of pathway infrastructure on the 7th of March, 97, so we see next to B1. Yes. Uh, and B2, uh, the release of what became known as software release 1B, which, as we can see, implemented OBCS functionality. Um, were you aware of, um, or can you describe what OBCS was? Uh, it was order book. CS something, I, I don't remember the, what... The control what, service. Control service, that's right, yes. And were uh, you aware of what its function was? This was uh, the service that was used to confirm that the person uh, in the post office uh, was entitled to the benefit that was on the, the order book, as I understood it at the time. Um, we can see um, a further date of the 30th of June 97, about midway down the page, and that was the planned release of um, Pathway Release 1C, uh, which was due to contain further OBCS, so the Order Book Control Service, and BPS, which was the Benefit Payment yep. Service, functionality. Um, we know, however, that milestone had been missed because at the point at which you conducted your review, development work on release 1C was ongoing. Is, is that consistent with your recollection? That is correct. What did you understand at the time about the state of development of the post office counters functionality, by which I mean um, EPOS, the electronic point of sales service, and APPS, the automated payment service? My goodness, I, I really don't remember. 
In your statement, you explained you adopted um, two principal methods of assessment. Um, the first being um, conducting a series of in-depth interviews uh, and follow-up investigative, investigative meetings with senior figures in each of the stakeholders, uh, those being the Programme Delivery Authority, Post Office Counters, the Benefits Agency, Pathway and ICL. Is that right? That's correct. The other aspect of your review or your, or your assessment uh, was a document review, essentially, is that right? Yes. In that um, you reviewed a significant amount of documentation relating to the technology status and plans for Horizon. Yes. If, if we could start um, by addressing the second of these methods, your document review, um, could you please describe the types of technical documentation to which you were granted access by ICL Pathway? Uh, we would have, uh, first of all, we have started with a demonstration of the model office system. Um, we would have taken presentations from ICL on the software status, uh, status of development, the, uh, the overall architecture, the way the system was supposed to work, um, and their view of the current issues in the program. What you've just described there it sounds mostly like practical, a, a practical demonstration and oral presentations, uh, rather than a rather than an analysis or a review of, of documents. Uh, did did you carry out such an analysis? There was yes, there were analyses undertaken by members of the team on technical documentation, mostly in the software area, um, uh, also uh, with Esha. Um, so it was other members of your team, yes, employees of PA Consulting, yes who looked at the more technical aspects. Yes. Do you recall what, if anything, they told you about the completeness or quality of the design documentation that was shown to them? I, sorry, I don't recall that level of detail, I'm afraid. Um, if we turn back to your first method of assessment, to which you referred in your statement, the interviews which you conducted, um, you described carrying out more than 30 face-to-face -face meetings and interviews, is that right? Yes. Um, do you recall the names of those whom you interviewed? Uh, they're all listed in the report. Um, could we possibly bring back up, back up PO, uh, POL 00028092? Sorry, we haven't... I say bring back up. This is <laughs> for the first time. Thank you. Um, at the conclusion of your review... Um, you prepared a written report, is that right? Yes. Um, and the third and final version of that is dated at the 1st of October 1990. That's correct. That's the report to which you, you just referred. Yes. Um, if we could turn to page 48, please, of the report. We can see here Appendix A, a list of those whom either you or your colleagues interviewed in connection with this review. Is that right? The, I probably met most of the people uh, on that list myself at some stage, either in individual meetings or group meetings with ICL Pathway particularly. Um, you've explained in your statement that some of the in-depth technical interviews were attended by specialists employed by PA Consulting, is that right? Yes. Um, why did you consider ne it necessary to bring in specialist, specialists to conduct those technical interviews? Uh, it, it's a way of working to uh, ensure that uh, we cover the ground appropriately. Did you yourself have the necessary expertise to deal with the more technical aspects of the project? Did I? Did you have the necessary expertise to deal with the more technical aspects of um, the project? On the networking and architectural issues, yes, but on the software aspects and particularly uh, in regard of Escher and the processes ICL were using for development, no. And you were therefore reliant upon Correct. your colleagues. Um, in your report, you identify um, a number of concerns about technical issues with Horizon which were raised by senior figures in the benefits agency, in, in post office counters, and pathway. Do you recall the nature of those concerns? In the report. If, 
I'd have to read the report again. <laughs> if it assists, uh, at, pa at page 28, please. Thank you. Um, at the bottom of page 28, there's a um, paragraph 3.3.5 entitled <laughs> Technical Issues. It records, concerns have been expressed to us about the ability of the solution to meet the security requirements, whether it is scalable to support a 40,000 terminal network, and what performance will result. Concern has been increasing with failures in test and by regular requests by pathway for exclusions to key releases, mainly concerned with security features. Is that consistent with your recollection? Yes, the security issue is a particularly difficult one, I think, for Pathway, um, because I, uh, I would say there were so many moving parts. Um, my recollection is that the security requirement was made increasingly more demanding as it became aware of the uh, risks and the risk transfer arrangements in the PFI contract to ICL. Um, could we please turn back to page um, eight of the report, where we see a part of um, your executive, of, sorry, your management summary. In relation to pathway at M3.4, Excuse me, if we could scroll down a little bit. You've observed here in the, the bottom paragraph, we believe the current status of the programme is surrounded by considerable contractual ambiguity. Pathway are, in essence, proceeding on an own risk basis to deliver release 1C with a known problems register. And its proposal is to address the known problems in release 2. Were you shown a copy of the known problems register? Uh, I'm sure we were. <laughs> what did you understand the purpose of the register to be? Uh, this would have been uh, issues that uh, were expected to take longer to resolve than the plan allowed, and therefore they'd be deferred into a subsequent release. When you say issues, what types of issues did you understand? Uh, development releases, essentially, that would take longer to work through. Are we talking about problems in the software, bugs and errors, um, defects? Not necessarily nature? problems. Uh, more likely uh, an underestimation of the effort and time required against uh, what I recall was, in some instances, a moving requirement over time. And uh, I, would, I would put the security requirement into that category, for example. So, so your understanding essentially was this, these were, these were generic problems with the software release rather than specific issues that had been identified? I think that's a fair description, yes. Um, in your report, you identified another significant concern uh, on the part not only of the sponsors, but also of Pathway, uh, which related to the robustness of the te technical architecture. Is, um, is that fair? Yes. Can you describe the nature of the concerns which were articulated to you? Um, at the time we did our review, my recollection is that uh, Pathway's approach to testing was to test individual components and then uh, fit them together um, and, and retest. And it was at that stage that I think uh, we detected there were certain concerns that when everything was put together, it might not be as robust as perhaps was expected. Um, do you recall whether the concerns expressed to you related to any particular component or whether it was a more general concern about the overall architecture? Um, th there was a particular concern about ESHA. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Pathway did institute a rework of ASHA software 
as a result of uh, the issues they were experiencing there. What steps did you take to investigate um, these particular concerns that, been, that have been articulated? Um, we would have pursued them with further investigations of any documentation that was available and further face-to-face -face interviews. What conclusions did you ultimately reach at this stage about the robustness of the architecture? That it would, I, I think we took the view that the overall system was achievable um, in development terms. The question was how long it was going to take before it became completely reliable and robust. I'd like to turn now to your findings about the causes of the chronic delays to the programme. Um, in your statement, you described the contractual arrangements between the parties as being a significant cause of initial delays to the programme. Can you explain the basis of that conclusion? The contract was let under a private finance initiative, which is uh, where the risk of delivery is transferred to the supplier. Um, and this particular contract was unusual in that there were differing business objectives between the sponsors. And uh, that created a lot of tension uh, between the parties. Um, and I think I've lost the thread of where I was going on that. <laughs> That's okay. So I think you've explained um, that essentially the, the much of the detailed specification mm for the contract hadn't been agreed at the point at which... Yeah, there were a lot of agreements to agree, um, uh, and I never was really sure why that was allowed to happen. Um, and normally, one would expect in a PFI contract that the supplier would, al would be allowed to work up uh, in once the contract has been let, the proposition to deliver for the outline requirement um, but because of the agreements to agree arrangement, um, it took a long time for ICL to work through each individual part of the system to decide what actually needed to be delivered. And at one point, I recall, they proposed to use a rapid application development method, which was becoming into, just coming into favour around that time, which allowed the developer to work closely with the sponsoring party to explore how an application might work. And um, I, I think ICL were unsuccessful in uh, pursuing that particular approach um, because of the reluctance of sponsors to become engaged. Did you consider the rapid application development technique to be suitable for a project of this scale? I couldn't see a reason why it wouldn't be, provided the parties were happy to pursue that particular approach. Um, and it, it's probably worth saying that uh, there were many occasions where we, uh, where, where we were coming to a view that this was being treated by the sponsors and particularly the benefits agency as a supply and build contract rather than a PFI contract, um, where there was a lot of intervention from the sponsors um, because they weren't necessarily happy for reasons of their own with what was going on in the development activity. And uh, that in itself caused delays. Um, another factor which you identified as causative of delay uh, and which related to the party's contractual arrangements concerned ICL's original assessment of the development work uh, and resources required to deliver the system. What conclusions did you reach in that regard? Well, ICL told us themselves that they had seriously underestimated the amount of work required, um, despite quite a long and protracted selection process, as I understood it. Um, and I, again, I think that was um, partly because of the complexity of the system. Um, I think at this stage, no one really fully understood the implications of the end-to-end -end arrangements and the necessary interfaces to all of the systems outside of the Horizon project that needed to interface 
in order to make it all work. And um, I think that, together with um, the agreements to agree issue, was a key cause for the delays. I'd like to turn now to the findings you made um, at this stage about the programme's management capability. Um, in your report, um, you expressed concerns about the resourcing of the programme, uh, and, and in particular about the level of managerial expertise within post office counters. Is, is that fair? Yes. Would it be fair to say you also expressed uh, some criticism of the programme delivery authority? Yes. Um, in your report, you describe the PDA as focusing almost exclusively on achieving a high quality outcome, even potentially at the expense of timeliness and cost effectiveness. Yes. That was one of the concerns you had at the time. Yep. Was it your perception that a more pragmatic approach that needed to be adopted, with trade offs being made between the performance of the product on the one hand and the business impacts of delayed? I think that's fair, yes. You ultimately concluded that there was no sensible way of descoping or radically altering the plan and that it was better to continue than to terminate. Is yes. Correct. Did you understand the parties to be contemplating termination at this stage? Um, there, were, there were veiled implications of termination, yes, at that stage um, uh, for... Uh, default against the contract by ICL, as I recall it. Um, on the 24th of September 97, you presented a summary of your findings to the PDA board. Yes. Um, which they accepted, I believe. Yes. Um, and uh, the recommendations which you've made to minimise further delays to the programme. Um, I think that was followed up by a, a meeting, a special meeting of the PDA board on the 2nd of October 97. Yes. You recall that where it was agreed that you would lead a series of workshops um, to examine the strategic risks to the That's program, right. as well as the root causes yes. of the delay. Yeah, the, I, th that was essentially to ensure that um, there was a common agreement on the issues um, before the parties decided to proceed and investigate what they needed to do. Did you regard those workshops as a, as a success? They were, yes. If I can move on now um, to the next significant stage of your involvement, uh, which came in the spring of 1998, you became involved in the programme again um, on this occasion at the behest of Her Majesty's Treasury, is that yes. right? Yes. You were appointed to act as a consultant to an expert panel chaired by Adrian Montague. That's correct. The head of the Treasury Task Force on Private Finance. The panel, as I understand it, had been established to review the deliverability of the Horizon project, together with the risks associated with the estimated timescales and costs of the programme. Mm. Is that a fair characterisation yes. of their function? So this is spring 98. Uh, do you recall the extent of progress which had been made in the programme by that stage? No. <laughs> I think you might be assisted if I were to refer you to the written report which was produced by the expert panel um, at the conclusion of their review. Um, I think it's correct that you weren't the author of that report, but your findings contributed or were taken into account when that yes. report was written. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I didn't know that there had been a report written at the time, um, but I have now seen it, and it certainly concurs with my understanding of what the panel was going to say um, at the conclusion of our work. Um, please could we pull up POL 00028094. Um, this is a copy of the report. Um, we can see at the composition of the panel there, um, Adrian Montague, Bill Robbins and Alec Wiley with whom you collaborated yes. in the review. Um, can we please turn to page 11? Uh, 
at point A, at the top of the page, uh, there's a heading, Current Status of the Programme. Paragraph 21 reads, The programme has moved on since PA reviewed it towards the end of 1997 and cites the following indicators of progress. Release 1C, a partial solution providing the benefit payment card and order book control service has been working satisfactorily in just over 200 offices since November 1997. Pathway has brought in new technical skills and management resources, increasing headcount to around 270 staff and introduced new procedures to support the high level of software development needed. BA has increased its resources on the program and release 3.0 of its key feeder system, CAPS, has been given D DSS, the Department of Social Security seals of approval. Post Office Counters Limited has also increased its resources on the program, establishing a pilot service management function and a national implementation organization to support Pathway in preparing outlets and training. The Horizon Program Office, referred to as the HPO, also started work on the 1st of April 1998. Does that reasonably encapsulate where, where things had, had it's a good reminder. by spring of 98? You were instructed by the panel to undertake a number of investigations into issues which um, you've identified in your statement. Um, these were the extent to which Horizon was future-proofed, whether it had the capability to support the electronic point-of-sale service, whether it could be developed to support simple banking applications, the likely lifetime of the technology, and whether, t whether the technology was suitable for long-term government infrastructure. Does that encapsulate That's correct. the areas? You've explained that in carrying out these investigations, you held a series of meetings and one-to-one -one discussions with ICL. Yes. Uh, sorry, with ICL Pathway, as it was, and had extensive engagement with each of the parties over several weeks. Correct. On this occasion, did you carry out any extensive analysis of the underlying documents? No. Um, does it follow that your findings then were based to a very great extent on the information that you were given by the participants? Y yes, that's correct. Um, together with uh, external research that we would have done um, as to the state of play in the deployment of EPOS, civil banking and so on, and the comparison of that with what the system was capable of doing. And I, if I recall correctly, um, we said we felt that the system could be developed to support those applications. The only question was how long it was going to take. Um, so if I can just clarify, what I understand you to have explained is that essentially you, you weren't looking at the party's underlying documents, so you weren't carrying out analysis of design documentation and so forth, but you were carrying out some external research in order to, I suppose, analyse what you were being told. Yeah, we were calibrating the art of the possible against what we were being told by ICL Pathway. Um, to what extent did your um, discussions with ICL Pathway um, touch upon problems that are, had arisen during the development of the EPOS application? Not at all. In fact, I don't think the Montague Review uh, looked at issues at that time, problems at, at all. In your statement, you say you have no recollection of being asked to inquire about the party's knowledge of technical faults and defects in Horizon during Correct. the review. Is that right? Mm. Um, albeit you weren't asked, did you yourself make any inquiries into no. these matters? Did you not consider the existence of known software problems might be relevant to Pathways' capability to deliver the program? Uh, no, we were looking at the, the, well, as I understood it, the panel was looking at the possibility uh, to reconstruct the programme uh, in a way that would make it more deliverable and remove some of the, um, the risks that weren't associated with the technical issues uh, on the basis that if the programme could be reconstructed to uh, achieve that, it was then a matter of time for ICL to deliver. But if there were very serious technical issues, would that not be very relevant to whether they would um, ultimately be able to deliver? I, I guess it's fair to say it could have been relevant. 
in your statement, you explained that your overall view of the Horizon technology was positive. Yes. Uh, and that you believe the assessment you made at the time was accurate. Yes. Um, would it be fair to say, though, that whether or not your assessment was accurate would depend on whether you were asking the right questions and you were receiving accurate answers to those questions? Well, inevitably. Um, but uh, the work that we did was guided by the steering the panel and we were not asked to investigate any technical issues at that time. If you weren't making inquiry into the party's knowledge of faults and defects, um, how could you or the panel make an accurate assessment of Pathways ability to deliver this solution? I don't think... Uh, It's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> the panel reached a number of conclusions which appear to have been informed by your own investigations and findings, um, and I'd like to explore some of those with you now, if I may. Um, could we pull back up POL 00028094? <laughs> Um, please could we turn to page 12. Um, I think it might be internal page 12, thank you. Uh, forgive me, I think maybe it's page 11, possibly written down the wrong. Uh, can we go back one page, please? Thank you. Um, we can see at the bottom of this page, heading B, solution design and fitness for purpose. Uh, and if we could go to the following page, please, page 11. Um, at paragraph 25, this recalls that the main architectural issues identified were scalability and robustness. We are advised, the panel said, that a solution of this scale and scope with so many different platforms and products has, as far as PA is aware, that's PA consulting, I assume, no precedent. We're satisfied that Pathways' approach to design, development and performance testing is sufficiently rigorous for such a major undertaking. Um, was that a reflection of the finding that you'd made at the end of your review? Um, I think it's probably more correct to say that was the panel's conclusion. Uh, the lead technical person on the panel was um, an MOD man, Bill, not Bill Robbins. And um, I think he, he probably did more than we did in terms of investigating the technical aspects. Well, you, I think it's probably fair to say and, and, and clarify, we weren't a member of the panel we were there being asked to, to investigate specific aspects. Um, I would imagine in order to clarify their own view or to concur with their own view. Um, in other words, we weren't given free reign. No, your role was, was to assist essentially and, yes. and to follow the specific yeah, yeah. investigations that you were asked yeah. to follow. Yeah, it was quite a, different, quite a different arrangement to the first review. Um, at paragraph 29, so on uh, the same page, we can see just, uh, just over halfway down, thank you. The project is probably the biggest of its kind, and many of the component parts, although sourced from industry strength products and companies, are being used towards their current limits and scale. Pathway has recognised the risks and has in place the controls we would expect to see <coughs> in a development project of this scale. Uh, again, was that... Um, based on your own findings, or as you recollect, was that a, um, something, a, a, a conclusion which the panel reached? I think that's a conclusion the panel reached. I... Uh, turning then to um, future proofing, which was one of the other aspects that you 
one of the aspects you were um, asked specifically to look at. Um, at page 13, please, of POL 00028094. Paragraph uh, 33, so the very first paragraph, it records that there is good evidence of future proofing at all levels. We're satisfied that all reasonable steps have been taken to ensure robust sources of supply and compliance with industry standards in designing the architecture. Upgrades to software platforms and individual components are provided for, should they be necessary. Um, now, bearing in mind this was an aspect that you had looked at, as I understand. Um, was that your finding, or was this informed by your findings? That was our finding. That was your finding. And insofar as you found that um, there had been compliance with industry standards in designing the architecture, that was a finding based on your external research of what those industry standards ought Correct. to be, and what you had been told Correct. by Pathway as to what they were doing. Yeah, Correct. The report of the panel states that you carried out a critical path analysis uh, to establish the risk of further delay to the program. Is that right? Yes. Uh, one of the factors uh, which you identified as being a likely cause of further delay was the absence of an agreement, uh, any agreement between the parties concerning the criteria and procedure for acceptance of the system. Is that right? right? What did you understand to be the areas of disagreement between the parties at this stage on the subject of acceptance? The disagreement was essentially about the specification and criteria for acceptance. And as I recall it, uh, the basis on which acceptance would be given and whether acceptance should be on a model office or a live trial, end to end, um, it, uh, under a, a live conditions. Um, that's essentially what I recall. Um, to what extent did the earlier concerns that you had about the resourcing of the program in this in the summer and autumn of ninety seven been addressed by? Uh, by the time of this review in July 1998? Uh, I think all parties had resourced up. Um, and my recollection is that there was still a concern that Pockle were not ready to accept a system of this complexity. And that's readiness in terms of preparing the network um, to live in a very highly structured environment as opposed to um, a, a very unstructured environment at the branch uh, using paper. Um, a question about whether they were ready to receive a system um, in terms of the help facilities and help desk facilities that were outside of the technical help desk. Um, did you have ongoing concerns about the competence or the expertise of the staff managing the post office counters aspect of the project? I think there were concerns uh, in, in terms of the number of people involved and their technical competences and their understanding of business process transformation that would be necessary to accept the system. We know um, from the report uh, that we've seen produced by the expert panel uh, that one of the proposals which they made was the appointment of a neutral troubleshooter to facilitate negotiations between the parties over the future of the project. Yes. Is that your recollection? Yes. Um, the individual appointed to carry out that role was Graham Corbett, yes. Deputy Chairman of the Monopolies and Mergers Commission. Is that correct? Yes. Um, you explain in your statement that Mr. Corbett uh, was tasked with advising ministers, uh, that is ministers in government, yes. on whether the framework suggested by the Treasury Task Force would provide a commercial basis for continuing, 
and whether the parties could develop a robust implementation plan to complete the project. Is yes. that your recollection? Because albeit you, um, as you say, you didn't author the report, you were aware that the um, expert panel had made a number of recommendations at the conclusion of their report. Is that right? Yes. That they, had, that they were not in favour of terminating the project at that stage. Is that right? That was my understanding. What they proposed had been either a full restructuring or a partial restructuring of yes. the programme. Yes, yes. So you became involved again in October of 1998, is that right? Yes. And at this stage, to test the feasibility of that restructuring exercise? Feasibility in sense of uh, the programme itself. Uh, you've explained that you were asked to join a, a working group established by Mr Corbett. Yes. That right, which was chaired by the director of the Horizon Programme Office. Do you recall who that was? No. It was David Miller. Sound like the correct. David Miller was chair of... Uh, sorry, the director of the Horizon Programme. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, the purpose of the working group... Uh, sorry, your task was to liaise with the parties um, as they answered questions posed uh, by Mr Corbett and to provide an assessment of any risks arising from the reconstruction. Yes. Is that right? Um, we can see um, an agenda for one of those workshops at POL 00090010, please. Um, if we could, um, forgive me, this is obviously a fax header sheet from you, uh, Peter Copping, to uh, Peter Krachen, who was a uh, um, senior figure in the Benefits Agency, uh, Mr David Miller at the Horizon Programme Office, and Mr Mike Coombs at ICL Pathway. Um, on the following page, please, uh, your letter confirming that you, you've made some proposals for the workshop. Um, and uh, on the third page, please. We have here um, a list of a number of issues for resolution. The first of these is E2E and model office testing. That's end-to-end, -end, is Correct. that right? And model office testing. The benefits agency were you, you were looking for the benefits agency to explain the current concerns about the testing philosophy, is that right? Yes. Do you recall what the nature of their concerns were at this stage? No. Um, you were looking to the Horizon Programme Office to describe the current process, as well as the proposals for management of re reporting of progress to sponsors. Uh, and it was your function, I believe, we can see PA, to identify any remaining disagreements, issues, concerns and sensitivities on that subject. Yeah. Um, so we also see, under topics for discussions, the service management product set. W what does that mean? Uh, this would have been the construct around service management, who did what, where they would reside, and so on. Um, the next section is the service management environment and the interim arrangements in place. Can you describe what those were, please? I really don't recollect that down to the detail, I'm afraid. Um, at D, we have multi-benefit with soft... EVP, that's a reference to the security, the extended verification yes. procedure, is that right? Um, and I think you're seeking there for Pathway to describe the plans to realise NR2+. Plus. Um, do you recall, in terms of the future software development, what the plans were at this stage in relation to the new release? No. It's called NR2. I recognise NR2, but I couldn't tell you what was in it. Um, thank you. And then I think there's one more page. Uh, beginning E. If we could zoom in, thank you very much. Um, consistent and complete technical design. 
BA to list areas where assurance is needed. And what were the concerns at this stage about, what were the BA's concerns at this stage about the consistency and completeness of Pathways technical design? I'm sorry, but I do not recollect. <laughs> Uh, we, can just, we can see then that the final, to final topics were acceptance testing and release authorization and the Horizon Program Office. And then under item two, the program critical path and dependencies. Is this um, an accurate reflection of the types of issues that you were dealing in, in the workshops that you were having? Yeah, this is, um, this is essentially a process that uh, we will have taken the, the sponsors through in order to flesh out areas of disagreement, which would then be documented for someone to go away and work on and decide how to take those forward. Your assessment of the programme and project management issues, which were prominent in autumn 1998, is summarised in an annex to Graham Corbett's report. Is that right? Yes. Um, can we please um, show POL 0002809898? Um, could we uh, scroll down to page 32, please? We can see here at the top, um, management summary key program risks. Um, is this a table that you produced or is it simply summarising your findings? I think it's summarising our findings. Um, so in terms of the risks that you uh, had identified, um, the first of those we see under the heading critical is the speed of acceptance process. Can you explain, please, the nature of your concern at that stage about the speed of the acceptance process? My recollection is that things on acceptance process um, got clogged up over disagreements on what the criteria were and um, how those criteria should be, differences should be resolved. Um, I really can't recollect any more than that. Um, in terms of the impact that, the, that this was likely to have on the program, um, it records that a failure to complete acceptance, sorry, a failure to complete acceptance in planned timescales could cause one or more of the parties to resort to legal action at, and program could stop at end of 98 or before. So it was the essence of the concern that unless the acceptance process could be agreed and implemented, it was likely to lead Correct. to litigation. Correct. What did you understand Pathways' position to be on acceptance at this stage? I, I think they were seeking to base acceptance on a self-certification process um, and, of course, no one on the sponsor side was particularly happy with that. Um, they also, I recall, were seeking to have acceptance on a model office as opposed to end-to-end -end acceptance, i.e. in a live system. I'll come back to the um, point about the model office and end-to-end -end testing um, shortly, but before I do, um, can we have a, just scroll down please to the uh, page, I think it will be 33, where we see the, what were described as the minor risks recorded. I wonder if we could zoom in, please. Thank you. So point four, risk number four, <coughs> under the heading minor, is the consistent and complete technical design for key products. The assessed impact of that on the programme 
is that it's likely to impact mainly on the speed of testing and the acceptance process. Yes. Um, did you not consider that the consistency and completeness of the technical design was relevant to assurance of the quality of the programme? I think it amounts to the same thing, doesn't it? Well, your focus here is on speed of testing and acceptance. Well, if if, uh, if the criteria for acceptance are all agreed and the system is submitted against those criteria and there are no issues, then speed will be fairly quick. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm following your point. I think my point is, is this, that um, you seem here to be attributing the significance of the completeness and consistency of the technical design. Um, its overall significance to the programme is its likely impact upon testing and the acceptance process. What I'm saying is that does it not also have a function in assuring the quality of the, of the, of the solution that's being put in place? Yes. On the um, fifth point, uh, also a minor risk, we have scalability of pathways design. Um, scalability was something that had been regarded as quite a significant issue uh, in your earlier reviews in 1997 Correct. and 1998. Um, why is it here characterised as a minor risk to the programme? Uh, well, because at that stage, I think there was beginning to be a better understanding of how the system would be rolled out and, and scaled up, uh, where scalability relates to the number of offices connected. Um, so it was, be, it was seen as, as less of an issue at this stage of the development. Well, but of course there could always be issues. If you, if you move from 10,000 to 20,000 offices, there might suddenly an issue might arise. Were both of these issues, that is the, the consistency and completeness of the technical design and the scalability of it, were they both not factors that were likely to affect ultimately the robustness of the system? Um, not necessarily, but possibly. Um, there's one topic I'd like to deal with, please, before we have a short break. Um, this comes back to um, the question of um, acceptance um, and you've mentioned in your evidence that um, you understood Pathways position to be that they were looking uh, for acceptance to take place at the end of model, model office testing as opposed to a full end-to-end -end test. Mm. Um, shortly after the negotiations that were being facilitated by Mr Corbett concluded, um, you wrote to David Miller, the Horizon Programme Director, in order to set out some private thoughts you had about, the par about how the parties might break through the potential impasse on acceptance. Is that right? Yes. I wonder, if, please, if we could um, pull up POL 0009009. So we can see here um, your letter of the 19th of October 1998 <coughs> um, addressed to uh, Mr David Miller, the director of the Horizon programme. Um, and as I've just said, um, your proposal to set out some of your private thoughts on the issue of acceptance. Um, that letter enclosed um, a paper, a short paper entitled 
acceptance testing a framework for developing a new paradigm. We can see that on page two, please. You observe in that paper uh, under the heading problem definition that the sponsors and pathway have agreed to de-risk the program by decoupling card rollout from NR2, which I understand is new release two, is that correct? Yes. And to base NRO, is that national rollout? Yes. On child benefit and EPOS only until NR2 plus, this is new release two plus, <laughs> further functionality is available when multi-benefit rollout starts. This new sequence raises a legitimate question whether an alternative acceptance process can be designed that protects the commercial objectives of the parties and which at the same time reflects the status of the revised programme at completion of model office testing and at completion of live trial. Additionally, the acceptance process for any requirement to be delivered during NRO, the national rollout, would need to be included in any new approach. Your paper essentially proposed a new paradigm for acceptance, and we can see that um, the essence of that distilled, uh, please, on page three. At the end of the second paragraph, you say, simply put, following your new paradigm, sponsors would give up ter termination rights on acceptance following model office testing in exchange for the option of being able to have more punitive SLAs, is that service level agreements, right. following the start of national rollout, should the system fail to meet acceptance criteria in live trial. Similar arrangements could be put in place for future releases of functionality and services. Would it be fair to say that, boiled down to its core, um, your proposal envisaged the sponsors forfeiting their right to reject the system, uh, even if it failed to meet the criteria which the sponsors deemed to be necessary for acceptance? Uh, yes. And I, perhaps I should put this in context. Um, the clues in this letter are, uh, it was a private thoughts letter, and in the last paragraph, next steps, um, bluntly, this was an unsolicited proposal for more work from PA, and uh, it was rejected. Um, it, it, it was indeed. Um, viewed from the perspective of the sponsors, um, this is an approach which would have been fraught with risk, would it not? Possibly. Um, by their very nature, model office tests tended to be carried out under optimal circumstances. That's yeah. right. Isn't it? Because they didn't accurately replicate the real life environment um, in which the system would actually operate, um, these tests were very unlikely to identify the full breadth of usability and performance That's correct. issues, uh, which would only become apparent ultimately in live operation of the system. Yes. By which point the termination rights would have been lost. Yes. So there was a risk in adopting this approach that the sponsors might find themselves bound to accept and roll out a system that later didn't prove to be fit for the purpose for which. Which is why it was rejected. <laughs> Bearing in mind those risks inherent in the approach, why did you consider this to be a suitable paradigm for acceptance? Um, it, it, we were trying to be creative to find a way through the acceptance block. Was this reflective of the pragmatism which you felt was earlier lacking in the programme and which had contributed to significant delays? Uh, I don't think we saw it in the broadest light. We, we saw that as... Uh, a possible opening of a discussion that could uh, help solve the problem. It was a pragmatic approach. Thank you. Um, so that brings me to um, the end of that topic. I wonder if now would be a convenient time uh, to take a, a short break. Um, yeah. We're making good progress. Good. So what time should we start again, Miss uh, Hodge? Shall we resume at 10 past three? Okay, fine. See you then.
Good afternoon, sir. Can you hear and see me? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. We can hear you. Um, Mr. Copping, picking up from where we left off, uh, which was the um, new paradigm for acceptance which you had proposed, which, as you say, um, did not find favour with the sponsors. You've explained um, in your statement that you continue to have some involvement in the public sector negotiations over the future of Horizon in the early part of 1999, is that right? Yes. But the last significant engagement which you had related to the acceptance of the system, is that correct? Yes. The, um, contrary to the proposal which you had made, which envisaged um, acceptance at the end of model office testing, um, we know that what post office counters and pathway agreed upon cancellation of the benefits payment card was that an operational live trial would take place, is that right? Yes. Um, by that stage, however, the thresholds for acceptance had changed. Were you aware of that? Yes. Um, could we please um, show POL 0002808? Thank you. Um, this is a copy of Schedule A11 to the codified agreement dated the 28th of July 1999, um, concluded between ICL Pathway and Post Office Counters. Um, I suspect you won't have seen a copy of this contract at the time. Correct. Um, have you read this document since? Yes. Um, we can see um, if we turn to the second page, please. At paragraph 2.2, .2, so about a third of the way down the page, a reference to the thresholds for acceptance of the CSR. Um, do you, were you, are you aware of what the CSR was, what it signifies? Uh, I don't recall what CSR stands for, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, I believe it's the core systems release. Right. Um, the name uh, given to the package of software tested during the operational trial uh, and ultimately uh, rolled out. Um, it comprised um, the EPOS, electronic point of sales service, the order book control service, which was still in operation, and the automated payment service. Does that sound broadly correct in terms of what it's, you understood? The that sounds familiar, yes. What this provision provides, we can see it's framed in the negative, but effectively says the thresholds will not be met if in respect of CSR acceptance, there are first um, condition one or more high severity deficiencies as categorized in paragraph 7.1A of the schedule known as category A faults. Alternatively, more than 20 category B faults and finally, more than 10 category B faults in respect of any one CSR acceptance specification. Um, is that broadly consistent with what you understood at the time to be the, the criteria, which the, the, the overarching criteria that the system had to meet in order to be accepted? Yes, uh, that's correct. So if there, were, if there was one or more high severity deficiency, it wouldn't be eligible for acceptance? Correct. Likewise, if there were more than 20 of a medium severity, right. it wouldn't be eligible. We can see on page three, um, at point five, under the heading appointment of expert, that the contract made provision for you to be appointed uh, as an expert to assist in resolving any disputes relating to CSR acceptance. Um, is that how you understood your role at the time? Uh, I didn't know about this at the time, <laughs> so I didn't understand that I was being proposed. When you did become involved, how would you characterise your role? Um, 
I, I, it was explained to me that my role would be uh, essentially to facilitate the parties to come to an agreement. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, allocation of blame from one party to another about uh, uh, what actually was going on on acceptance. And uh, it was explained to me that my role was to ensure the parties work together to resolve conflict. And uh, through that process, um, reach an agreement on the level of severity of each incident and a resolution plan. Um, I subsequently found out that uh, apparently I had the opportunity to um, arbitrate, but I don't think, to the best of my recollection, that was ever exercised by either party. In other words, I had the option to tell them the way it was going to be on particular incidents. Do you recall being consulted by either of the parties about the arrangements that were put in place in the contract? In, in this contract? No. Um, it appears from your statement and from the records we've obtained that you were first called upon to provide assistance to the parties on completion of the operational live trial. Is, is that consistent with your recollection? That resonates. Um, in preparation for a meeting, which appears to have taken place on the 16th of August of 1999, uh, you were sent what was described as a hot list yes. of acceptance incidents. Is that right? Yes. And um, please could we pull up POL 0002835? <coughs> This is an email um, from Tony Horton, dated the 13th of August 1999. We can see you named as one of the one of many recipients. Um, they're the, the fourth uh, in the list. Um, could we turn to the following page, please? Here we have the acceptance incident hot list. Um, could you please explain what you understood the significance of this list to be? Uh, this was a list which I identified all the incidents that were outstanding together with those where there was a disagreement on its severity and I think from memory there were three, possibly four, where Pockel and ICL Pathway were in disagreement. So I think lo looking at the list uh, it appears as though there was disagreement in terms of severity on almost uh, every single one of the... Sorry, incidents. I was looking through a lens of the medium to high. Uh, forgive me. So, yes, there were three incidents um, categorised by Pockel as high. We can see the first of those in the list being acceptance incident number 376, which is described as the derived cash account not equaling to the electronic cash account. The next high severity um, is in relation to training to a uh, number 218 is described as the training course cash account module inadequate. Um, Pockle have assessed that as high, whereas um, Pathway are treating that as closed at this stage. And then thirdly, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Pockle infrastructure, acceptance incident number 298 described as counter system subject to lockups and, and screen freezes requiring reboots assessed by pathway as a low severity incident but by post office counters as high. I think there's one in the category of medium to high which was number 369 also in the POCL infrastructure scanner reliability in relation to order book control service transactions. <laughs> Um, so that was the state of play at the end of the operational life trial, so far as you were aware, yes. is that right? Do you have any recollection of the meeting that took place on the 16th of August of 1999? I might need reminding. Um, I don't think we have any record, written record of that meeting. Ah. Um, but we know that um, 
the disputes between ICL pathway and post office counters um, over the status and severities of these incidents were not resolved at that meeting. Um, that much is clear from a supplemental agreement reached between the parties on the 20th of August, 99. I wonder if we could please pull up FUJ 00000485. I've got the number of zeros right. Oh yes, thank you. So at the top we can see this described as a supplemental agreement dated 20th of August 1999 between post office counters and ICL pathway. Um, if we could please scroll to page three. Thank you. Um, under the heading, it is agreed as follows. We can see in relation to CSR acceptance, paragraph 1.1, the parties agree that CSR acceptance was not achieved as at the end of the CSR operational trial review period. Um, and if we go on please to page four, there's proposed here a, a remedy for the outstanding faults in the system. It, it provides with a view to facilitating the obtaining of CSR acceptance and second CSR acceptance test. The parties agree as follows. Paragraph 2.1, in the period between the date of this agreement and the 17th of September of 1999, described as the limited trial period, the parties will set up and conduct a program of joint workshops for the purposes of agreeing to the extent not already agreed, the resolution plans for the agreed category B faults, the disputed category A faults, the disputed category B faults, and if appropriate, the unagreed fault. Uh, it goes on to say a single timetable for resolution of outstanding category B faults that would form part of that those workshops. I think you recall participating in those workshops, is yes. that right? Um, we can see they were, ch sorry, they were chaired uh, by Keith Baines, the late Keith Baines of Post Office Counters Limited, and uh, Tony Oppenheim of ICL Pathway. Yes. Um, on page five, you're referenced again, um, on this occasion, <laughs> were you consulted about uh, your involvement? I assume you were on the 16th. Not that I recall. Uh, so here at uh, 2.4, the parties will involve Peter Copping as expert in the activities referred to in this paragraph 2, uh, to which we've just referred. There may be occasions on which the expert is asked to determine an issue as between the parties in accordance with the provisions of Schedule A11, but otherwise his role will be as facilitator and advisor to the parties in their efforts to achieve successful resolution of outstanding issues. That seems to tally with what you've described earlier as your understanding, that is to say the latter part, facilitating mm. agreement. I hadn't seen this document at the time. But it reflects as far as your It concerned. reflects my understanding. Um, you explained in your statement that um, prior to each of the joint workshops to which this schedule, uh, this supplementary agreement makes reference, um, you received briefings from each of the parties uh, relating to the status of the acceptance incidents. Is that correct? Yes. That's something I asked for, if I remember. Um, did the briefings you received include ICL Pathways proposed plans for resolving the outstanding acceptance incidents? I, I'm not sure whether all the proposed plans were included. Uh, we'll take a look at some of them shortly. Um, in the hot list that we reviewed a short time ago, we looked at three acceptance incidences that were graded high by post office counters. Um, I'd like to explore with you now what you recall about those. Um, if I could begin with acceptance incident 218. Um, what did you understand this particular incident to entail? 
th this concerned a post office view that the training for Horizon users was inadequate. Um, and I think in response, Pathway uh, offered a number of initiatives which, uh, which involved half-day training for um, post office counter staff in IT usage, computing, and so on. Um, the underlying issue here, I think, was to do with the situation that I mentioned earlier, that Pathway hadn't, in completeness, considered the business transformation that would be necessary to accept the system. And with that, all the process changes that uh, would need to take place at the counter. Um, and my recollection is that uh, the, there were extremes of counter configuration from quite a number of counters to a simple remote terminal in an outlying area. And uh, users, uh, if I recall correctly, between uh, 20 and 75 or 85 years old. So there's a tremendous spread of capability that needed to be trained. Um, I think my understanding that was why the post office decided this should be categorized as high severity impact. Do you recall whether the concerns about training were focused on any particular aspect of the training program being offered? Um, my recollection is that there were a lot of issues around closing of accounts. Um, and, and, and it was unclear at that stage whether that was a training issue or a system issue. Um, so far as you're aware, this was an incident that was resolved to the satisfaction of the post office during your workshops, is that right? Yes. Um, I'd like to turn to um, another incident. This was AI298, also categorised by the post office as being of high severity. Um, could you describe your understanding of that incident, please? This, this was about uh, instability in the system. Um, the symptom being lockouts at the terminal, crashes at, in, in the middle of a process, system busy incidents, and so, and, and so on. Um, and I think Pathway took the view that this was pretty normal for IT. Um, PCs crash, PCs lock up. Um, the post office, or POCL, considered this to have a high impact on the business, um, simply because while the system was down, customers couldn't be dealt with, and therefore... Um, it had a high impact, um, and so there was a disagreement about the severity. I think Pockel classified as high severity, um, ICL pathway, I think, as medium. Do you recall how this particular incident was resolved? My recollection is, it, is that it wasn't resolved through the series of seven workshops, it was escalated to the management um, resolution meeting uh, towards the end of probably August, early September. Thank you. Um, we'll return to that final workshop, that final meeting, sorry, um, a little later. Before we do, I'd like to address with you um, the, the, the third incident categorised by post office as high severity. Um, and that is instant AI376. Uh, um, what was the nature of the problem that had been identified so far as you were? As I understood this, um, it was about intermittent failures in the reconciliation process between the money in the till and what the system had recorded. And at the time, I think it was believed the root cause was about integrity or lack of integrity in transfers between post office and ICL pathway systems. Um, 
Do you recall where in the system this problem had arisen? At the TIP interface, as I understood it. And can you explain what you understood TIP to be? <laughs> it's the interface between um, between the, the, the post office system that is responsible for counting and the ICL pathway interface that, and the database that recorded the transactions in the system. Um, you've, you've described the root cause as being a lack of integrity in the information passing. That was my understanding at the time. Um, do you, before we um, go to one of the documents I'd like to show you, um, do you recall how the problem had come to light? Uh, wh how it had been detected in the system? Not specifically, I'm afraid, no. Um, please, could we um, show POL 0002832? Um, this is another email of the 13th of August of 1999 um, from Andrew Simpkins um, addressed to you and to David Rees. Uh, is that, was that at a colleague at, at PA Consulting? Correct. Um, it says, Peter David, following the management resolution meeting yesterday, I attach as agreed um, by post office counters and pathway the minutes of this meeting and a summary of the incidents that are in dispute. The minutes will give you an up-to-date position on the high-priority incidents in particular. We propose that the meeting with yourselves does not start until 2, uh, 12 p.m. It will be in Gavril House, room number seven. If we could um, please turn to the minutes on the following page. So these, of course, not a meeting that you yourself attended, uh, but minutes that were shown to you to bring you up to speed for the meeting that we've... Um, yes to which we've referred on the 16th. On page three, please. Uh, we can see um, just over halfway down the page, at point three, the heading review of high priority incidents. The first of these being acceptance incident 376. Um, JD, who I believe was John Dix, um, an employee of ICL Pathway, reported that Pathway recognised that not all transactions had been harvested and sent to TIP. A provisional fix went in on the 2nd of August and this had worked satisfactorily so far with the effect that all records had been sent. A root cause analysis has been developed identifying eight contributory problems and all but one has been diagnosed and tested in Pathway to date. Pathway cannot guarantee, however, that all problems have been trapped. They will need to see evidence from the fix of the eight known problems and will continue to monitor the problems for eight months to be confident of its, re its resolution. The provisional fix and the controls procedure developed allow Pathway to identify any errors, to patch the file and to notify TIP in advance. Since implementation, there have been no errors to report and hence Pathway contend that this action taken to date and the result they have observed justify the downgrading of this incident. We know, of course, it, it wasn't ultimately agreed that that incident be downgraded. Correct. And hence uh, why uh, the workshops took place. Um, so far as post office counters were concerned, what did you understand their assessment of the business impact of this incident to be? Uh, an inability on a consistent basis to reconcile um, horizon data with cash data. Would it be fair to say it was an issue of fundamental concern to post office counters? Uh, I would have said so, yes. The principal purpose of Horizon being to perform an accounting function. Absolutely, yeah. Which would enable post office counters to reconcile the transaction performed by its agents at the branch counter with its own records of cash and stock held, um, as well as the transactions performed on behalf of its clients. Correct. If, this, if the system wasn't producing accurate cash accounts, which appears to be what this, this incident was showing, 
did this not call into question its very fitness for purpose? Uh, yes. Do you recall how ICL Pathway proposed to rectify this problem? In broad terms, yes. Um, there were a number of um, a number of proposals in the resolution plan. I think the most worrying was that uh, one of the fixes wouldn't be implemented until the year 2000, um, uh, either at the end of 99 or 2000. And uh, it was that um, that caused the incident to be escalated to the management meeting at the end of the seven workshops. Um, not just because the final fix wouldn't be available until the end of the year, but also because regression testing would therefore take place afterwards. And if there were further issues to be found, um, that would not be something that would rest easily with rollout. Um, if we could take a, slight, a closer look at um, what was discussed at these workshops. Um, you attended one on the 26th of August of 1999, is that correct? If my, if my name's on the agenda, yes. Um, could we show POL 00028472, please? Um, this is an email from um, Altiel Walker to um, Graeme Cedar and others. Um, you're not a recipient of the email, uh, but if we could um, please turn to page six. We can see here a minute of the acceptance workshop. This is number two held on the 26th of August 1999 and you're under the attendees you're listed first as the expert Peter Copping and the first item uh, that appears to have been discussed is acceptance incident number 376 the issue of data integrity at point one it records that post office counters needs to be confident of the root cause analysis and fixes both apl both applied and planned to be applied. And the proposal was that a working group of post office counters comprising a number of employees there and pathway, um, in, bracket, in brackets John Pope, an employee of ICL pathway, were to review the TIP incident status report and report back progress and issues to the workshop. Um, under point three, we can see Pathway proposed to introduce a fix to ensure that the cash account does not lose transactions. And there's reference to a pinnacle. Were you aware what a pinnacle was? No. no. Um, as I understand it, it was a, a record of an incident, the method by which that Pathway recorded incidents in the system. As part of one above, that is to say that the root cause analysis and fixes um, a review was to be taken to fix and confirm acceptability of the fix to this group. And if we could turn the page, please, we can see at point five, there's a reference to Pathway proposing a three-level mm. data integrity check to be implemented in December. This needs to be documented as a high-level design, including failure state analysis. Um, we see their post office count is limited, a number of employees identified in brackets are to be involved in interactive walkthroughs during the development of the design to report issues, to, forgive me, to report progress and issues to the group. At point six, it records that post office counters' position is that rollout should not commence until data integrity can be assured. At Ruth Holleran, an employee of post office counters, is to consider with the auditors and report back to this group whether the current pathway checks plus possibly continuing post office checks would be adequate until pathways full data integrity checks are in place. 
And finally, at point eight, we see a reference to Pathway preparing a rectification plan that will be presented to the group. And so this appears to be the state of play as at the 26th of August, 1999. Yes. I understand you don't have a detailed recollection of these events, but is, does that broadly tally with what you understand yes. the position to be? Um, point eight to which we've just referred um, mentions a rectification plan um, that was produced in uh, response to acceptance incident number 376. Um, I believe you were shown a copy of that plan. Um, yes. If we could bring that up, please. POL 0002846. This document is dated the 4th of... September 1999, we see that at the top, version 0 0.3. Under the title, it's the acceptance proposal for acceptance incident 376. And the abstract records, this document contains ICL pathways proposal to the independent expert in respect of acceptance incident 376. Under distribution, you're named as the first uh, to receive it, expert Peter Copping. Do you recall seeing this document at the time. I do. I don't know why they address it to me specifically. <laughs> um, if we could turn, please, to page five. We can see here summarised Pathways position um, in relation to this incident at f uh, paragraph 5.1. They set out the background. During the live trial and since, incidents have occurred that, in post office counters' view, constitute a potential threat to the integrity of their accounts. These can be categorised into through three groups. Point one, some outlet, tra some outlet transactions were not sent to TIP because the harvester deliberately omitted incomplete records caused principally by missing modes and because on one occasion harvesting started before replication between recovering correspondence server nodes was complete. The, two, the second uh, principal cause was that not all transactions were completed in the outlet cash account because of end dating of item reference data. And thirdly, that some cash account records were sent to TIP because the pointer used by the harvester was not available. Either because a counter was rebooted before it could write it, um, or because on one occasion a second balance process was allowed to run. Pathway um, suggests that important advances have been made since the above incidents occurred, uh, which are discussed below under the same numbers. And we see here, I think, a list of uh, fixes that have been applied to address uh, the, the causes identified at one, two, three above. The first of these being that all instances of messages written without harvester sensitive fields have been fixed, except one that will be fixed shortly. Accounting integrity has been safeguarded by establishing routine examination of the event logs to detect and report daily to tip any harvester exceptions. The harvester has been enhanced to positively check that the full message set for an outlet is present on the correspondence server before initiating harvesting for that outlet. Secondly, that the system is being modified so that the balancing and cash account processes can continue if an, if an item is end dated during a period for which there are transactions. And thirdly, the system has been made robust against inopportune reboots by writing persistent objects to the message store, enabling controlled restart of the office balance process after power failure, etc. A change has been made to ensure that multiple balance processes cannot Thank you. Run concurrently. In addition, a message will be displayed to inform the user that the balance process has initiated. So here we see Pathway essentially presenting a, a picture of three principal causes for the imbalances having been identified. Would that be a fair characterization? Yes. Three, th I, when I say root causes, three um, overarching root causes and the fixes that they've applied 
or plan to apply? Or plan to apply to address them. Do you recall how widespread these cash account discrepancies were at this time? In terms of quantity, no. Um, could we please turn to page eight of this document? Um, it appears that this table was appended to ICL Pathways acceptance proposal. Um, do you recall being shown a copy of it at the time? I've certainly seen that before, yes. Could we zoom in a little bit, please? Thank you. So we can see at the top, um, it's entitled Incident Analysis. At the very bottom, it confirms that these are the figures recorded as at 5 p.m. on Friday the 3rd of September, presumably of 1999, bearing in mind the date of the document. Um, at the very top, we see number of outlets affected by cash account week. And the top row appears to record the cash account weeks numbered 8 to 27. And the left-hand column, the root causes. Do you agree with that broad analysis of the table? Yes. So I think what we can see um, here is that there are two root causes, number 9 and 10, so missing mode scales, replication recovery, that in the periods, uh, in the week 16 to 19, have caused quite a substantial number of outlets to be affected. So in relation to 9, there are 22. In relation to 10, there are 37. Um, and following the application of a fix, what this appears to record is that those um, that no further uh, no further outlets have been affected, but in total over that period, we see 80 outlets affected by one of the 12 root causes of this problem. Is that a fair yes picture? Um, it's not necessarily the case uh, that this equates to 80 different outlets, I think, because one possible interpretation of the table is that a single outlet was affected in more than one week. Um, but this is quite a high figure, is it not? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, particularly when we bear in mind the relatively small number of outlets that were in fact operating the system at the time. Is Correct. that right? Yeah. Do, do you recall how many branches operating horizon at this stage at this stage would it be about 200 i think it was um approximately 300, 300. the region of 299 mm. when viewed in that context um 80 branches being affected by cash account discrepancies is is very significant indeed isn't absolutely it? we can also see from this table um if we can zoom back in please In the um, penultimate row, uh, it starts with a question mark under investigation, which appears to suggest that there were 36 um, branches affected by cash account discrepancies for which no, root, no root cause Correct. had been identified. So at this stage in early September 1999, would it be fair to say cash account imbalances remained a very serious problem? Yes. In addition to the fixes that Pathway had identified in their resolution plan, um, they had also proposed introducing what was called a um, three-level data integrity check. Uh, we can see reference to that at uh, paragraph 5.2 on page 6 of this document, please. Five point two, the heading maturity of plan. Excuse me. It says the pathway proposal in this area has now been expanded into the high-level design document, logical design for EPOS TIP reconciliation controls. And it goes on to review that was a document that was being um, reviewed by the working group in detail. 
Um, do you recall um, seeing a copy of that document? I think I've seen it somewhere. It might have been just recently, it might have been quite a long time ago. Um, before we go to it, um, can you explain what you understood this um, three level data integrity check to entail? I thought you might ask me that, and the answer is no. I've seen a very complicated des description from ICL Pathway in a letter written by Tony Oppenheim, I think in the pack. Um, if we could turn up, please, POL 0009042890428. This contains a copy of uh, the second supplemental agreement concluded between ICL Pathway and Post Office Counters um, on the 24th of September 1999. So at or around the time that your involvement came to an end, I think that's right. Um, if we could turn, please, to page 135. This is a copy of the logical design for EPOS and T TIP reconciliation controls. It's dated the 20th of September, 1999, as version... 0.7. I mean, it's quite a lengthy document. I don't intend to take you through all of its detail. But if we could turn, please, to page 6. Oh, I apologise. Um, uh, uh, it was 135. It's internal, internal page 6. Forgive me. Uh, so that should be 141. Thank you. Um, under heading three overview, um, there's quite a helpful um, summary of what the process was intended to entail. It records the reconciliation processes will be split into two separate sets of activity daily reconciliation tasks and weekly, or more accurately, at the end of each cash accounting period, the CAP, um, weekly reconciliation tasks. The daily task will ensure that the base transaction data recorded at the counter matches the base transaction data transferred to TIP for that day. At the same time, the transactions will be used to generate total uh, control totals for the cash account tables to which the transactions will report at the end of the cash account period. At the end of the cash account period, the daily control totals generated for each cash account table will be accumulated and the resulting value calculated for the payments and receipts table will be compared with the cash account line records generated by the cash account production process. If there is a discrepancy in this comparison, then the system will validate each of the accumulated daily control totals with the corresponding cash account line records to identify the table which does not reconcile and record an error message in the repost message store. The existing functions in the system, which create the outlet stock holding rec records and the cash account line records, will also be amended to accumulate a control total for each set of records which will be written into the message store at the end of each set. These control total records will be harvested and inserted into the TPS host database. The TPS host system will compare the stock holding records and the cash account line records output to the TIP cash account subfile with the control totals received from the OPS system. In the event that the TPS harvester fails to locate either the stock holding records or the cash account line records or the control records calculated by the TPS host system, differ from the control totals received from the OPS, then a reconciliation error report will be produced. Does that assist you at all uh, in relation to how this piece of software was intended to function? It resonates. And of course, the big question is, what happens with the, re with the error report data? If I've understood it correctly, and that, that is a big if, um, these new reconciliation controls 
I think were intended to automate a task that post office counters have been performing temporarily in TIP, is that right? In that they've been seeking to verify whether the base transaction data recorded at the counter was consistent with the transaction data being transferred to TIP. Yeah, I think the aim was to have a completely automatic reconciliation process which corrected as a result of the, the process, the checking process. Whether that happened in practice, I, I can't say. I think, as you've said, it, it was a system which was designed to generate a report to verify that the error had taken place. Mm. Uh, to, forgive me, to verify that an imbalance had been detected. But what the, what the reconciliation control didn't do, did it, was identify the root cause of the discrepancy in the first place. I think that's right. As I've explained, um, as you've explained, forgive me, you attended a series of workshops, um, the last of which I believe took place on the 17th of September 1999, is that I right? I think so. Um, do you recall what progress had been made in relation to resolving AI376 by that stage? Um, it was still, as I recall it, uh, categorised as high by POCL and medium by ICL. Uh, please could FUJ 00079176 be shown on the screen. Thank you. So we can see your names recorded under attendees at this meeting on, this, on Friday the 17th of September 1999. This was the last of the seven workshops Correct. that had been arranged. Um, if we could turn to page six, please. Um, at the bottom is the heading AI376 Data Integrity, the substance of which we can see on the following page. Um, and if we could scroll down, please. So here is essentially an, an update on where things are in relation to the data integrity checks. Pathway, it, records, as we've seen before, that Pathway were proposing a three-level data integrity check to be implemented in December, with the relevant design uh, documentation to be um, considered. At the fourth workshop, the update was that post office counters uh, had considered the high-level design to be generally good, but wanted further checks to be undertaken uh, in relation to failure scenarios and operating procedures. We can see then under workshop number five that post office counters um, had reviewed the identified failure scenarios and some issues with the high level design which needed clarification. It was proposed that a meeting would take place to discuss post office counters paper, the EPOS TIP reconciliation controls, summarising the failure scenarios and the design issues. And a further update on at the workshop on the uh, the sixth workshop, forgive me, was that progress was good, and that pathway to issue a paper for post office counters to review. Uh, the final update is um, at the bottom there for workshop seven. Pathway had issued the high level design. I assume HLD means high level design paper for post office counters review. 
and post office counter to provide their written comments to John Pope. Um, so that's essentially where we were with the, the high-level design. Could we go to the next page, please? Um, in relation to whether or not um, to accept and roll out the system, this confirms pathway position as stated in, um, previously, was that rollout should not commence until data integrity could be assured. At workshop number four, the update was to the effect that post office counters and pathway needed to develop a contingent approach, possibly including indemnities, suggesting that Keith Baines and Tony Oppenheim would meet with the lawyers to initiate that process. At workshop number five, post office counters position remained that the incident should be classified high until the data integrity fix is in place. Um, further, internal meetings were proposed to confirm the position. Workshop number six. This will now be part of the contractual discussions being held between post office counters and pathway. And at workshop number seven, the one uh, that was held on the 17th of September, it says this issue is now focused on the success criteria for national rollout resumption. It confirms at a review in November, which may be an error because, of course, these, minute, these minutes are dated September, Pathway had previously proposed four weeks operation with a less than 1.5 error rate. Keith Baines and Ruth Holleran proposed an error rate of 0.6%, the current average being 1.2%, together with six other conditions, five of which were listed in a paper that RH, presumably Ruth Holleran, had produced, and the sixth being a further two-week period of live running of the permanent cash account fix prior to the actual recommencement of national rollout in January. The penultimate paragraph recalls Tony Oppenheim responding as follows. A 0.6 error rate agreed, subject to this being measured as the average of six weeks from the 4th of October to mid-November, with a maximum of 10 working days to analyse each tip fault, comprising a root cause analysis, diagnosis and agreed resolution. And that was agreed except for faults requiring diagnostics. A further two-week period agreed subject to agreement on the logistics of the plan. On the basis of the current plan, this condition would lead to a two-week delay in the plan date for recommencement of national rollout, and this was agreed. Read the error rate criterion, the cash account does not reconcile and is attributable to an error in the POCL domain. The error rate is to be calculated as the ratio of the number of incidents and the total number of cash accounts during the six weeks period. So this is where we were on the 17th of September. What, did you un what do you understand these discussions to relate to? Um, two things. There was still a problem with 376, and there was some negotiation beginning to start about what the acceptance criteria might be for that particular incident. But you use the term acceptance criteria. Um, would it be right to refer to it maybe as conditions? Um, the conditions upon which yes. the system might be accepted? Yeah. So what we have effectively here is evidence of discussions taking place concerning the conditions on which post office counters might be prepared to accept the system, notwithstanding that, that ongoing cash account imbalances were being yes. detected. And the proposal from Keith Baines and Ruth Holleran, employees of post office counters, was that an error rate of 0.6%, together with a number of other conditions, would be acceptable. Was that your understanding at the time? It resonates with me, yes. Do you recall the advice that you gave to the parties um, concerning the conditions upon which the system might be accepted? in late September 1999? I, I don't recall giving advice on 376. 
were you in favour of post office granting conditional acceptance to the system at this stage? I don't think I indicated that, no. Are you essentially saying that you played no part in facilitating the resolution of this particular incident by this late stage in September? By implication, I suppose uh, I had an impact in the parties getting to that position. Um, but there was a subsequent meeting uh, between the two senior people which continued to debate what those conditions should be um, and that ended in an, an, in a, an agreement that further staff work was necessary to understand the implications of those agreements and I didn't pay a part in that. My understanding was that there was some further negotiation which resulted in an agreement for somewhat different conditions, but I don't know what they were. Um, just dealing first with your, the, the level of your involvement with this AI, you were of course present at the meeting on the 17th when these conditions were being mooted as, as, a, possible <coughs> quite a, as a possible condition for accepting the Correct. system and rolling it yeah. out. Yeah. Even if you didn't give specific advice on it, you were aware that this was what was under discussion by the parties. Yes. That's right. And to accept the system with ongoing cash account imbalances, did you not consider at the time that that represented quite a significant risk to post office counters? And I think we discussed that. Because an error rate of 0.6% in any given week would have equated to more than 100 post office branches yep. when spread out to the national network. No, it's quite significant. Now, I think you say you don't recall having any part in the final resolution that was reached, but I wonder if we could look at POL 0008397. This is an email uh, from Keith Baines on the 22nd of September 1999 to um, a number of uh, employees of post office counters, Andrew Simpkins, John Meager, David Miller, David Smith and Ruth Holleran. Um, it records, um, the subject of it is the AB and RAB on Friday. Do you know what that is a reference to? Acceptance Board and Release Acceptance Board? I think it's the Acceptance Board and the Release Authorisation Board, possibly. Right. Um, it says, John Andrew, at this morning's briefing session with Stuart Sweetman on the acceptance position, there were some discussions about the role and empowerment of the AB and RAB. I've since spoken to Jeff Triggs and obtained his view on this and then discussed with David Miller. The position is as follows. Post office counters will not be accepting the service against the existing contract and therefore the nature of the decision on ex off at the acceptance board is different to that originally intended. The board should make a recommendation as to whether or not the second supplementary agreement, which has been negotiated with the pathway over the last few weeks, should be signed. The, suppl the supplementary agreement then states that acceptance is deemed to have taken place and the various contractual consequences of that, such as payment to pathway, will follow. The same applies to the RAB since the supplementary agreement says that Post Office Council Limited has authorised rollout. The supplementary agreement is formally a change control note to the contract and therefore can be signed by David Miller. It doesn't need Stuart's signature. Can you please make this rather subtle change in the roles of the meetings apparent in their agendas, please? That's from Keith at uh, 1327. Can we turn to the next page, please? So this is a further email um, on the same date at 1351 and subject being the supplementary agreement. The enclosed is my understanding of the position. We agreed at the end of yesterday's meeting with Pathway. 
there is one area not yet agreed, namely the question of how to count incidents under AI 298. The wording in the enclosure is that suggested by Pathway and recommended by Peter Copping. We're not able to agree it yet. We're not able to agree it yet yesterday because we don't have the right people available to review it. Can John and Ruth look and comment to me? Copy to Jeff Triggs, please. So can we turn to the following page, please? So here we have um, the position reached in negotiations on the 21st relating to acceptance incident 298. What the previous email suggests is you had some you had some input on the wording of this particular on clause. 298, do, you, yes. do you recall that? Yes. Um, that provided that the occurrence of operational incidents in connection with this AI should have been reduced below a target threshold as measured over the four weeks. Measurement will be based on all outlets installed uh, before or on the 1st of October 1999, provided there are at least 750 such outlets. If we scroll down to the penultimate uh, paragraph, the target to be met is that the rate of occurrence measured over the four-week period to mid-November should average no more than one unit per counter position per three months. So that essentially was the, the target set for resolution of AI 298. Correct. Is that correct? And on the following page, please. We have acceptance incident 376. This refers to the arrangements for the integrity control to be implemented by Pathway by the 31st of December 1999, uh, and that those will be as previously required by post office counters, apart from the, the uh, following amendments listed below. And so, is it right to say your, your evidence is you had no involvement I think in the this detail? Was, of I think this was an agreement that was struck between Pockel and Pathway without my involvement. After the workshop on the 17th of September of 1999, do you recall having any further involvement in the Horizon system? Uh, my involvement ceased after the 24th of September 1999. Oh, forgive me, and the, and the meeting to which, the further resolution meeting to which we've referred. Um, S sorry, I'm not... Following. Sorry, my question was whether your, your involvement ended on the 17th, but you attended a further meeting, as we've just... Um, I attended one meeting which was between Richard Christou and David Miller, I think, which was the first stage of the escalation process defined in the acceptance documentation. That meeting... Uh, ended with an agreement between the two that further staff work would be necessary in order to understand whether or not there could be an agreement on 376. I did not take part in that process and I'm not familiar with the output. At the point at which you ceased to be involved uh, in Horizon, what was your professional assessment of the robustness of the system? I think my overall assessment was that the post office had, in, in accepting the system, and this is a benefit of hindsight judgment, uh, had accepted further risk in agreeing to accept the system and release um, for rollout with the proposals from ICL, particularly on 376. Um, we certainly talked about what needed to be put in place in order to monitor and mitigate any risk arising, but I really don't know what happened after I left the project in terms of risk mitigation and further testing of the uh, bug fixes that were being put in place beyond the acceptance timescale. Thank you, Mr. Copping. I have no further questions for you. Uh, there may be some questions from the representatives of the core participants. 
So yes, I, I have uh, just one short area of questions that have been uh, permitted by the inquiry team. Uh, Mr. Copping, my name is Sam Steen. I represent a number of large group of uh, sub-postmasters, mistresses and managers. I'm going to take you to a report that you've dealt with already with uh, um, my learned friend. That's P-O-L-000-28092. And Paul, if you're handling the, thank you very much, if you're handling the, um, what we see on the screen, could you go to internal pagination on relativity, page 7 of 132? And uh, roughly uh, two-thirds of the way down, you'll see the paragraph, Paul, that starts our key concern. Could you highlight that paragraph? Thank you. Now, Mr. Copping, I'm just going to remind you of what's being said here within this report. Our key concern is that the skills required for many of the new senior posts are, in our opinion, not those we would have expected to find as part of uh, POCL core competencies. This is especially true in relation to implementation management and contract and service management. There seems, however, to be no evidence of external recruitment activity or robust plans to create the competence internally. Um, Mr. Copping, that, that, that seems... Uh, to foreshadow a, a fairly uh, bad problem within Pockle. Do you agree? Yes. Um, and the reason for that is that you are talking about uh, major parts of the future planning. That's implementation management. That's putting it into place, yes? yes? Contract, that's oversight, presumably, of the contract yes. to get Horizon working. And then oversight of the service, which is then being provided by yes. Horizon. These are core competencies. Yes. When um, sub-postmasters and mistresses uh, started to use the Horizon system, uh, they found, as their evidence has set out, that the training was inadequate, that there were difficulties that, uh, with the operation of the Horizon system, and in particular difficulties with trying to make sure that they could achieve balance. Yes. Um, achieving balance in relation to their accounts is an important part of their process. Do you agree? Yes. Um, if there is insufficient oversight and knowledge of the Horizon system within the post office, within POCL, um, does that mean that these, these particular difficulties that uh, postmasters and mistresses were suffering from uh, might not be remedied by the post office? Um, I don't think I can answer that question. Um, I think at the time we did this review in 1997, uh, there was no doubt in our minds that the post office uh, had a shortfall in competent resources in the areas we discussed. There is no doubt in my mind that the post office did resource up. Um, and my recollection would be that David Miller was the first um, significant appointment that was made in that resourcing up process. Um, I would still maintain... A, later stages of my involvement that the post office had a shortfall of what I would describe as general technical competence that was capable of properly interrogating the pathway personnel as to exactly what was going on in the development process um, and everything that flows from that. So in other words, your concern then and concern remains towards the end of your time working on this project that uh, the uh, post office might not have the technical ability to understand what's actually happening within the system. Is that fair? I think that's fair comment, and it, it's broader than that as well. Um, there was also a ready for, readiness for acceptance of the system within the post office poker pockle organisation. And all that implies in terms of service management on the post office side, as opposed to the technical side, which was ICL's responsibility, um, and the need for process change in order to support new ways of working. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and finally, it's stating perhaps the blindingly obvious, but um, Horizon was a new way of working for the post office. Absolutely. Anything else? No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Copping, for providing written evidence to the inquiry and for coming to give oral evidence. I'm grateful to you.
Sir, um, I believe Miss um, Page has some questions for the witness as well. Oh, I see. Sorry, I appreciated that. Thank you. Just one, in fact, from the questions which we were permitted, uh, and it's on acceptance incident 376, which you've just described, as you did in your statement, uh, as something which uh, you understood Pockle to be taking on more risk as a result of the position as it was left when you um, no longer were involved. Correct. Um, would you, therefore, have expected those risks that they were taking on, those additional risks that they were taking on, to be registered in some way, perhaps by the board or by some management level, and monitored until uh, they were satisfied um, those risks were no longer significant? Yes, and I don't know whether this was, uh, this was put in place. What would normally happen on a project of that sort would be a, a formal risk assessment process. Um, which is updated on a regular basis uh, within the program. And if insufficient progress is being made, for example, on uh, bug fixes and um, regression testing, then those risks would begin to replicate themselves over time. And that, in turn, one would expect would escalate uh, the issue to a higher level through the organisation. Whether or not that was put in place, I can't say. But that's what you would have expected? That's what I would have expected from a, a management point of view, yes. Thank you. Right. Well, I won't repeat my thanks, but um, thanks again, Mr Copping. Um, and I take it that now is the end of this session. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. That concludes the evidence of today. All right. Well, then we'll meet again on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you all very much. Thank you.